Hello, good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have so many people uh, joining us today. Uh, cardiovascular disease and overlooked women's health issue is the topic of today's webinar. Uh, it's part of a bigger campaign that we launched a few weeks ago, Many Faces, One Heart. This particular uh, event is a cycle of two um, webinars endorsed by our partner, the European Atherosclerosis Society. My name is Magdalena Deco, I'm Chief Executive of FH Europe, and I am delighted to be uh, joined today by wonderful um, advocates, speakers, uh, friends, and experts. Uh, before we start with our webinar, uh, I would like to take this opportunity and tell everyone who's joining a little bit uh, shortly about FH Europe. Uh, so with that, Anna, I will ask you to go to the next slide, please. Um, I wonder if it's just me uh, and I'm having a little bit of an issue with the, with the slides uh, and the visibility. Uh, we are one year into the virtual meetings and still things like this are happening, whether we, we've practiced this or not. So uh, bear with us. You don't. Uh, we fix that. You don't have the next slide. I have the next slide now, uh, but it's a little bit blurry. Uh, if you can just go back. The, the slides are a little blur blurry, but uh, I hope we can fix that as uh, the individual speakers will be uh, sharing them independently. In a nutshell, FH Europe is the European FH patient network. Uh, we are a network of 25 organizations from 24 countries across Europe. Um, next slide, please. Uh, should be with you in a second. Our mission. Our mission is the advancement of health and the prevention of early cardiovascular disease, hence today's topic. However, uh, our ultimate goal is to reach out to a wider uh, public, patients and, and stakeholders and talk about uh, the sleepidemia. And so we are dedicating a lot of our advocacy work to inherited dyslipidemia. And as you can see, our advocacy scope covers familial hypercholesterolemia, so inherited high cholesterol, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, so the rare form of FH, and other inherited lipid disorders. Uh, I am delighted to see that our one and only uh, moderator, Sam Gidding, is back online. So with that, Sam, how about if I give you the virtual stage and finally put myself on mute? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I... Uh dropped out. I'm Sam Gidding. I'm a preventive pediatric cardiologist and trustee of FH Europe, and welcome to this uh, important webinar. Uh, we're now going to warm up uh, everybody with two uh, questions. So, Anne, we, I think we're going to show yes. the questions, and you'll get a chance to respond to them. If everyone goes on to their phone or to their browser and join us on slido.com, you will, I will send a link in the chat as well. So, or you can actually scan the QR code you see on the screen now with your camera on your mobile phone, but we're gonna launch the first poll. Um, so you should be able to answer that once you go on slido.com and you put an FH web in one. So we would like to kind of hear who is joining us and we're getting a few answers already. So Anne, if I, if I read correctly in the chat option, we have a link. We basically exactly. want to understand who is joining us uh, it's a warm up exercise, a little bit of polling. So go to the chat, click on the link, and answer the questions. So, right now we see there's uh, a bit of a mix between patient and doctors. There's also quite a few who says others. 
you're obviously also welcome to elaborate on that in the in the chat function um just so we know a little bit more let's see if we get a, we're getting a few more responses now Okay, so we have a pretty broad mix from many of uh, many different stakeholders. Uh, which yeah, and we have one of the yeah, and one of the others says that they're a lab specialist. So I guess it's yeah. some have more more specific titles within the industry. Okay. Let's just get a few more responses before we move on to the next question. On to the next one. Okay. So the next question, yes, is open ended, and we would like to, with one or two words, for you to to write what do you hope to learn from today's webinar. Anna, are we using the same link? Yes, it should be once you join slido.com, it should now appear on your screen um, on the same thing. So you don't have to go anywhere. So we have the first person who's the prevention treatments. We have a few different people answering now. So there's quite a lot of people. So the words you see in bigger now, like risk factors, is because more people have put in the same thing. Um, so that's obviously an interesting thing. And I think we'll definitely be covering some of that with our presentations today. Let's see a few more. We can also share this after all the results. We can share them after the event as well, if anyone is interested. But yeah, I think risk factors and prevention are, are a little bit dominating. And obviously there's a lot of specific answers as well. I don't know if you have anything to add, Sam, from your side, if there's any, any surprises. No, I think a lot of people are just interested in the knowledge of, in understanding uh, some of the specific factors that do relate uh, to women and heart disease. So I think, we ready to move on to the next, um, to our first presentation? Absolutely, let's do that. I'll stop. Okay, so I would like to uh, say that we have a very diverse panel. We begin with a patient and then we move on to a presenter who is both a patient uh, and a physician. And then we move on to a, a clinician who specializes in women with heart disease and finally a geneticist who will show a key type of statistic that shows the importance of women in heart disease, as well as a segue to our next presentation. So Inesa, would you like to begin and introduce yourself? Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be uh, today and happy to see you, uh, so many here. And um, I am the head of patient organization. Uh, it is uh, for heart and cardiovascular diseases. It is called parsirdi.lv. That means for a heart or about a heart. So I'm from Latvia. And uh, we work with different kinds of uh, patients who have cardiovascular diseases like hypertension, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, and also uh, FH or familial hypercholesterolemia. And we are also members of FH Europe. But uh, the reason why I am today, it's, it is not just only this one, but I have, I have to tell you a, a secret. Uh, I am also a patient and I have hypertension. 
And actually, it's not a secret or something I'm hiding, but uh, it's not something I'm thinking about on a daily basis that I am a patient and I have some uh, health, uh, health issues. This is what I tell to other people, to our patients, uh, to people I meet uh, during my work, when I want to explain them why it is so important to know your health risks, uh, to check them, uh, to get diagnosed on time and to get also uh, the right treatment. Thanks to my work, uh, I'm doing already 10 years working with different kind of patient groups and working in close collaboration also with doctors and uh, different kind of patient networks. Uh, I've learned a lot and uh, I know that uh, cardiovascular disease risk can lead to stroke or myocardial infarction and actually that's why I am so scared to tell the truth. But the good news is, as we all know, as earlier we will detect uh, the, those risks and uh, as earlier we can also prevent our disease. And um, I was uh, diagnosed five years ago uh, and actually it happened kind of uh, ironically because it happened during our event organized by our patient organization. And the goal of the event was to educate people about risks of high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And during this event, I had just a very big headache and I was very tired and I thought uh, I might have some problem. And I also checked my blood pressure and it turned out that it was uh, pretty high. And since I was aware about the risk factors and uh, since I was really scared already before, I, I went right to my GP and afterwards also to cardiologist just to check and just to be sure if I have uh, uh, some issues with hypertension or high blood pressure or everything is okay. So uh, it turned out after a while that I do have this diagnosis and um, I needed to make some changes in my lifestyle and also to get some treatment because it was not enough just with the lifestyle changes. Uh, but what I want to say, it, it didn't surprise me, this diagnosis, um, because uh, actually I started this organization 10 years ago. I didn't have any, any heart conditions, uh, at least I didn't know about that at that time. I started because of my parents, partly because they also have a different kind of uh, premature heart and cardiovascular disease risks. And also my great grandparents uh, died uh, very early uh, due to cardiovascular diseases that uh, were not treatable at that time, uh, some 50 years ago and a little bit less, uh, some 30, 40 years ago. So and these days, uh, this, uh, this all has changed, but I was surprised uh, that, um, uh, that I was diagnosed so early uh, because uh, I, also, I also thought like, like a lot of people think that high blood pressure or high cholesterol levels are pro problem of older people or, or unhealthy people. Um, but yes, that was kind of surprise, but um, okay, I know that and it, uh, it, uh, it helps me uh, and at least I can control this risk uh, and also I can share my experience with our uh, patients. And what does it mean for me as a, as a woman uh, being, uh, being uh, a patient? I am working woman, I have two children, I have a lot of duties to do and not enough time uh, to do physical exercises to think about myself as much as I would like to, but still I'm trying to because I am, I feel responsible. I feel responsible for my family but I also feel responsible myself for my health condition. And I understand that if I will not do something, then nobody will. So I have to take care of it. And especially during COVID-19, uh, we know that uh, heart and cardiovascular diseases are a very, very uh, high risk factor for different kinds of complications. And uh, therefore we do organize a lot of campaigns also in collaboration with FH Europe and other international networks uh, to create this awareness and uh, to, uh, to encourage people, don't forget about your own disease, about your chronic disease you already have. And um, I have also this experience. I, I, um, I was infected with COVID and uh, I was diagnosed during um, uh, during Christmas. I still don't know where and how it happened because I tried to be really very careful. I was scared like everybody else. 
But uh, luckily for me, uh, it was not so bad. I had all the symptoms uh, and I was sick for, uh, for at least a week. Uh, but um, what I think, I, I was very good prepared. I, I'm sure it's not the only one reason, but this is what we are telling also to other patients. And this is why I was scared uh, that I need to be prepared. I have to have a good health condition. I have to have a good controlled uh, blood pressure numbers. And probably that also uh, helped and uh, this disease didn't uh, develop and uh, didn't cause any consequences. At least I feel right now very good and 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 this was kind of experience. Uh, and the good thing is I have antibodies. So, but yeah. Uh, regarding uh, yeah, what 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 I'd like to suggest or what I can suggest from my uh, from my own experience and from experience working with patients, is really I'd like to encourage every everybody to go and uh, check uh, check all your health numbers uh, at least once a year because really we ca we cannot know probably we have already this disease inside of uh, of ourselves we don't feel it uh, probably we are not having it and we will not have it but uh, but just just to be sure because my example also shows that uh, i work with it a lot and i didn't have an idea i also also could have high blood pressure and uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to suggest to check your blood pressure, to check your cholesterol level, to check your sugar level, and also to check your pulse and pulse frequency. And we can do it quite easily uh, already at home and just to be sure and consult with your doctor. And I know it is very, and me as a patient and working with a lot of patients, it is very, very difficult to change your lifestyle and to start something new, like you wake up and you, you are diagnosed with one or another disease. It's, it is not easy. It is for me also a struggle every day uh, to, to get some time to get to physical activities. For example, now you can see behind me, this is a sport equipment and I'm trying to use it when I have some time, even during uh, sometimes Zooms, <laughs> or some 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 meetings when it's possible of course but uh, it's it's a struggle but uh, but on the other hand it is really worth it because we know that today due to due to science due to development of medicine and technologies we really can live longer and we live a, a quality life and we can be diagnosed with diseases on time only if we go to doctor and if we check ourselves so I wish you I wish you all the best and I, I wish you a good health and a very interesting uh, evening today also with the, our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Anesa. Uh, morale. Mara, we will need you to unmute yourself, please, uh, because we don't want to lose any of your vital information. Okay, so sorry. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and I'm taking care of lipid patients, especially FH for patients for more than 20 years. And on top of this, I'm an FH patient. Uh, I want to begin uh, by sharing a famous uh, painting from Frida. Uh, to draw your attention to my topic, woman and cardiovascular disease. As you can see from the painting that there are, uh, there are two young women, uh, both of them are Frida, and one of them's heart is bleeding, uh, and it's the young woman, so I want to mention that the woman could also have uh, heart disease. Well, uh, let me go with... Uh, that causes uh, from Europe. Uh, I know the, the bars are a little bit confusing, but if we look uh, closer, we see that, uh, by the way, the left -hand side is the woman's that causes, and the uh, uh, right hand side is the for males. Uh, you see that the top three colors are representing the cardiovascular reasons for that. And as you can see, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. Uh, for both men and women. And this ratio is about 50% in women and 40% in men as a cause of uh, primary of that. 
But unfortunately, most of the women are away, uh, afraid of uh, dying because of breast cancer. But if you look here, uh, breast cancer uh, is responsible for only 3% of the women's death. Uh, let me uh, say, in say in a different way that uh, one of every six women uh, will be dying of breast cancer, but this ratio is one of every two women for cardiovascular disease. And again, I want to mention here that most of the people, even the physicians, are not aware of this. There are lots of surveys conducted on this uh, topic, and most of the people uh, in this surveys are replying that uh, the breast cancer is the most uh, important reason of a woman's death, but it's not. The problem is there are very important misperceptions. For example, uh, everybody thinks that heart disease is a man's problem. And they also believe in that only older women uh, could have heart disease. And the reason for these two mites uh, are the, they believe that estrogen is protecting women from heart disease. Well, this is true, but not for women, especially with women heart uh, with risk factors. The protective of uh, estrogen uh, can be harming to women. In normal, healthy women on ch childbearing ages, uh, makes the arteries of the woman more elastic. Uh, the woman's arteries are smaller, uh, but they are more reactive with increased inflammation. But as I said to you. If a woman has a risk factor, this could be high blood cholesterol, high blood pressure, or, or being overweight, diabetes, or even smoking, this protective effect uh, is becoming harmful uh, to that young woman. Let me tell this in a figure. Just on the top, you see a normal artery uh, without atherosclerosis. But on the left-hand side, there's a men's artery with atherosclerosis. This is the same for older women. And on the right-hand side, there's a young woman's artery with atherosclerosis. We call here atheroma. It means the cholesterol plaque. You know that the atherosclerosis is generated by the, by the lipid accumulation, namely the cholesterol, in the wall of the artery. And when you look at the men's and young women's arteries, you see that although the uh, burden of the atheroma, the size is the same, here, as you can see, the narrowing of the men's arteries are much higher. And as you see, women's arteries are not narrowed due to the effect of estrogen. So what does this mean? This means that with a narrowing artery, a man or an older woman would have typical symptoms. This means that they could have an easy, definite diagnosis. But in women, in young women, as the artery is not narrowed, but there's also a huge atheroma, this means that the symptoms are unusual. And this means late diagnosis. And also we could have uh, normal coronary angiograms even though there is a huge atheroma in the artery of a young woman. So all these misbeliefs and estrogen effects in young women with risk factors uh, lead to less preventive measures, as I said, unusual symptoms. And of course, with a more difficult diagnosis leading to late diagnosis, late treatment, and also less aggressive treatment. And all these come together and mean a higher mortality in women and men. Uh, I want to share another data from my country. We conducted a study to see the uh, death rates in uh, men and women after a heart attack. And as you can see here, both in the early period, in the hospital period, or in the late period, one year after the heart attack, women are dying more than men. The red bars are representing women, blue bars are representing men. And you see in the early period, it's twofold, threefold, and in the late period, it's twofold. The major reason is again, women are late in seeking medical care because they don't believe, they don't aware of heart disease could uh, happen in them. Also, they call emergency medical center 30 minutes later than men. So this is a very golden period. and. Uh, leading to higher mortality. These are all, 
all, all true for women with FH. Uh, I will give you a few numbers here. 30% of untreated women with FH will develop cardiovascular disease by the age of 60. This means that uh, as an FH, uh, as a woman with FH, I can say that uh, of, 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 of our uh, women, 30% will have premature cardiovascular disease. And the onset of cardiovascular disease is occurring 20 years earlier compared to a woman without FH. This is a very, very early time. Compared to men, women with FH diagnosed with FH four years later. And for myself, it took five years to realize that I, have, uh, I had an FH, even though my brother uh, had died at the age of 33, and even though I'm a lipidologist and a cardiologist. And women are less likely to receive uh, the proper therapy um, in terms of attaining the LDL goals. So we can easily understand that women with FH are at higher risk. So this is my conclusion slide. I want to remind you the Frida's uh, young woman with a bleeding heart uh, mention you that the heart disease is not only a men's disease. Young women with especially cardiovascular risk factors are also prone to have a heart attack. Uh, and unfortunately, they present with unusual symptoms and they seek medical care later than men. And all these means they are underdiagnosed and undertreated. And of course, this leads to a more complicated course of the heart attacks and heart disease, and especially women with FH are at high risk. So uh, we have to educate women to increase their awareness and education and cardiovascular prevention in women are extremely important as women's heart health affects not only her, but also her children and the whole family. So this is the most important fact that we have to realize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morale, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I think when we can get the slides uh, change. We'll move on to Janine. Hi. Um, can you see my slides, first of all? We can see your slides yes. and we can yeah. hear you. Okay. We're, yeah. yeah, we're good on the <laughs> slides. Uh, That's the most important. Yeah, yeah. Give us a brief introduction as to who you are, please. Well, my brief introduction is that uh, I'm um, uh, Janine Ruters van Delft. I'm an internist, vascular medicine uh, associate professor working in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands. Um, and I'm very grateful that I can be here tonight with you uh, and share uh, the knowledge about uh, women in cardiovascular disease. Um, Moral, Dr. Moral already talked about the disease, so I will continue some more about symptoms and some about uh, risk factors, some general risk factors that both men and women can have, but also some women specific risk factors. Now I hope that my slide will, yeah. Well, this is a very classical image uh, depicting Angina, angina pectoris, chest pain. Uh, this was uh, in what the students and also I learned when you were talking about a heart attack. Uh, and then there was this image about an elderly man, white, um, and he was coming from a restaurant. Maybe he had something to drink. He came into the cold and then he grabbed to his the left side of his chest and he dropped his um, his suitcase in his left arm and this was for many this was the picture of chest pain this was the picture of having a myocardial infarction but later on we found out that of course uh, there are also other ways of um, having a myocardial infarction uh, and what also was discovered is that uh, there are differences between men and women. 
Um, and we also know that still also in women, uh, having chest pain is the most common symptom of having a cardiovascular uh, event. Uh, it's not like men are from Mars and women are from Venus, so they have totally different symptoms. But what we do know is that women can have more different symptoms than, uh, so they have chest pain, but they also have cold sweat, they also have nausea or vomiting. So for women themselves, it can be quite difficult to recognize that they're uh, at that moment having a heart attack. But even though if they're feeling that there's something wrong with them, then the second step is that also their physician uh, acknowledges that it might be a heart, a heart problem and refers them to uh, the first aid or the, the cardiologist. Um, I think that right now there's more and more knowledge coming into that, but still uh, it's very important to acknowledge that there's more than chest pain. On the other hand, I also want to stress that it's not exclusively women who have like what we, we call atypical symptoms. And I think that the term atypical symptoms already says enough. You have men, they have the typical symptoms, you have women, you have atypical symptoms. But it's also men and among men there are also differences. So I also have patients who I even say, say to them like, oh, if you were, would have been a woman, then everybody would have said, of course, these are typically the symptoms that a woman with a heart attack would ex experience. So I think it's important not to make the same mistake again. So then if we go to the uh, cardiovascular risk factors, and most of these risk factors you might already know, and diabetes, glucose, smoking, having a family who have premature cardiovascular disease, uh, hypercholesterolemia, but also um, well, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, so lifestyle factors are also important. But one thing is clear, they're bad for both men and women. However, some of these risk factors can be even worse for women than for men. And that's the case with diabetes, for example. So if you are a woman with diabetes, and normally you have some like they call female protection by estrogen. But if you have the diabetes, you are like you have the same risk as a man. So you lose your female protection. And the same is with smoking. And this is what I say to my patients. Uh, uh, smoking is bad for everybody, for both men and women. But if you compare a smoking man to a non-smoking man, they have a cardio experience on average, a cardiovascular event six years earlier. But if you compare a smoking woman to a non-smoking woman, they experience uh, a cardiovascular event, event even 14 years earlier. So smoking has even more impact in uh, women than in men. Uh, and it's also more difficult for a woman to stop smoking. And of course, the cigarette industry knows that. So right now, they're really targeting everything to for young girls to um, to get them start smoking because they know if they can choose to have a woman smoke as a girl smoke or a boy smoke then they'd rather have a girl uh, to be a smoker because they know that it will be more difficult for her to stop so they will earn more money from her but then uh, there are also female specific risk factors um, and they are, for example, pregnancy related risk factor, such as gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension, or even preeclampsia or HELP syndrome, which are even more uh, advanced uh, complications. But also, um, there is evidence that some phases of the menstrual cycle, and women, uh, if a woman is in her menstrual phase, that she has a higher risk of cardiovascular disease or events. Uh, but also, for example, if you have a premature menopause, 
which is before the age of 40, those women have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And then you have, well, it's not really female specific because of course men also can have migraine, but migraine occurs much more in women than in men. And especially migraine with aura is uh, um, uh, 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 a cardiovascular risk factor, especially in women. So then uh, if we talk about pregnancy related risk factors, there's this like statement saying, a pregnancy is the ultimate stress test for the cardiovascular system because actually a pregnancy is comparable with running the marathon for your body. So you can imagine that, uh, of course, fortunately, in a lot of women, they don't experience complications. But especially those women who already have, they might have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, they have a lower threshold of experiencing complications. Um, and one of the severe complications is preeclampsia. Women with preeclampsia develop um, high blood pressure during pregnancy, but they also have protein in their urine. Um, they swell up, they have water retention, and uh, they are also compared to like a Michelin. Uh, person. It's like very, uh, if you have once seen it, they will never forget it. If you have had a friend who had preeclampsia, and then you have the severe forms, those women also experience uh, headaches or blurred visions, uh, pain, and also sometimes organ failure for uh, babies that don't grow very well anymore. But pregnant, we now know that preeclampsia is not only a problem during pregnancy, but also for the rest of your life. Because we know that women who experience preeclampsia have an increased risk, about twice increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease later in life. Preeclampsia, by the way, occurs in about five to eight percent of all pregnancy. So it's, it's a rare, but it's not even so rare. And there are many of you who might know somebody who has experienced preeclampsia during pregnancy. Um, we also know that especially high blood pressure uh, is something that develops earlier and has a higher risk in women who develop, who had preeclampsia. So um, uh, it's also important, Ines already said that she had High blood pressure for women who had experienced high blood pressure during pregnancy is especially important to uh, keep on measuring their blood pressure also after pregnancy. Um, and we also know that the more severe you had your uh, pregnancy uh, complication, the higher you had the risk. So if you had a very severe preeclampsia, very early preterm baby, or you have, were very ill, then you, your risk is even higher than two times increased, but it might be even seven times increased. What can you do yourself? Well, first of all, it's very important, know your numbers, measure your blood pressure, and also get your cholesterol and glucose measured. Because if you know uh, your numbers, then you can act on it. And also very important is lifestyle. So eat healthy, exercise regularly, and also on the website of FH Europe, there are many tips about it. So my take home message is inform all women that you know, all your sisters, your mothers, your daughters, your friends about cardiovascular disease, and also uh, help them to prevent, uh, to get it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, I'd like to move on uh, to Steve. Lots of things to think about there. Sorry, I will stop share. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Hey. Not yet. Right. Not yet, no. 
have a gray screen at the moment. Um, I'll try again. Yeah, do that. That's the beauty of uh, virtual events nowadays. Everyone, please take that moment and pop oh, your questions we, in Q&A. Okay. We have them now, Steve. Go Good. Thank you very much. So thanks, Sam. Uh, so I'm the professor of cardiovascular genetics at University College in London. I've worked there for more than 30 years uh, with a research team trying to understand how heart disease runs in families and therefore how, how to be able to predict those and identify those who are at high risk. And I've had a particular research interest in uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, which is what I'm going to tell you about uh, that, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this short uh, slide presentation. And you've heard about FH quite a lot, but let's actually have a look at it and make sure we all know what we're talking about. So familial means runs in the family. Hyper means high, cholesterol means cholesterol, and emia means in the blood. So familial hypercholesterolemia means inherited high blood cholesterol. And as you probably understood from, from, from the previous speakers, if you've had a genetic cause of having high blood cholesterol since birth, it means that the blood vessels in the heart get bl blocked up much more quickly and this increases your risk of developing heart disease at, at a young age. So that's the problem that people with FH have, and, and uh, Meral sh sh uh, showed us this in her, some, in her slides. So why does FH run in, in families? You have FH, I've drawn a little family here, and here's, here's, here's you in this family. You have FH because you've inherited what we could call an, an FH gene, and you got it from, from your mum or dad. And an FH gene doesn't work properly, so that the, the LDL, the bad cholesterol, isn't taken out of the blood by the liver, so it builds up in, and you have high levels in your blood. Because it's genetic, on average, half of your brothers and sisters are also likely to have FH, and on average, half of your children are also likely to, to have FH. So what's the problem? Why is the LDL in, in the blood so important? So You've seen the slide like this from, from Merrill. We're all born with nice, clean arteries like this. And, uh, and because we have cholesterol in the blood because of our bad diet and other sorts of things, the arteries start to fur up. Uh, and Merrill sh showed you a picture like this. But this is silent. This doesn't cause any problems. It's not till you get to maybe this stage in someone in the general population in their 50s or 60s that the, the plaque, the developing uh, cholesterol laden plaque, it starts to fill up the vessel. So the vessel is smaller and not, and not enough blood can get through. And so you get chest pain, which is the, the angina, which um, um, uh, Janine mentioned. Now that, that the angina, the chest pain isn't the problem, but it is a warning sign that your arteries are furring up. This is the real problem. If this little, this little a thin layer here breaks down and the, the lipid gets into the blood vessel, it co can cause a clot. If the clot blocks the artery, it means blood and oxygen can't flow to a part of the heart and you get this heart attack. And here's a, a picture from the British Heart Foundation, uh, this typical chest pain. And clearly what you've got to do is call the emergency room as quickly as possible. So that's the sort of timeline in someone in the general population. And someone with FH, because they've had very high cholesterol from birth, it means the whole process is speeded up and they develop their heart attack or they're at risk of having a heart attack 20 to 25 years sooner. So that's the problem. That's the bad news. The good news is that you can lower LDL very effectively by taking a statin. So we wanted to ask three questions. Do men and women with FH have the same risk of heart disease? Does taking a statin lower the risk of heart attack in people with FH? And are men and women with FH getting the same benefit from statins? We looked at this in the, the UK Simon Broom FH register. Simon Broom was a man who, who died of an early heart attack and his widow Kathleen set up this register in order to find out what's causing early heart attacks and, and then of course how to stop them. So we have in the register over 3000 men and women with FH that have been followed for over 40 years. When a patient dies, we're sent the, the death certificate and we can see if the cause of death is cancer or an accident or heart disease. And we compare the death, the death rate in people with FH with that in the general population in, in the UK. 
And what we did is we compared the heart disease rate in FH patients in the pre-statin era. So before statins were available, lipid lowering was by diet, not very effective, or by an agent called resins, which we don't use. And then we looked in the low statin era when some of the, the early statins that, that were made available were given to FH patients. They lowered cholesterol a bit, but not by very much. And then after 2008, when high intensity statins became available, when you could get very effective uh, um, LDL lowering. Okay, so this is the what's going on with the heart disease rate. So this is in men and women in the pre-statin era. era. So men with FH were dying about 3.3 3 times higher at a higher rate than the general population. And women, it was 4.3 times. So the immediate conclusion is that before statins were available, the death rate in women with FH was about 30% higher than in men. Okay, so what happened in men uh, when the low intensity statins were available? Well, it fell a bit. And then when high intensity statins were available, it fell even more. This is really looking very good. With more effective statins, death from heart disease falls progressively in men with FH. How about in women? So in the low statin period, it fell quite a lot. But then in the high statin period, we were shocked and I'll say upset to see that it looks like the, the heart disease death rate in women even though high statins are now available, is as high as if statins were never available. Now, clearly, this is not right at, at all. Uh, and it's, uh, it's something we really need to, to look at. And you can understand from the talks that you've heard now, some of the reasons why this is happening. Uh, are women being treated later after children because you can't take statins whilst you're trying to get pregnant or whilst you're pregnant or, or breastfeeding? Are they being treated with lower doses of statins? Possibly. Are they being given, not given the high intensity statins? Possibly. Are they being offered the statins and not taking the statins? That's also possible. And these are the sorts of things that we as clinicians and, and, and you as patients need to be looking at to try to find out what the answer is and how so we can treat women with FH so they can get the same benefit as men. Sam, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. And I would like to thank all the speakers for giving excellent, provocative presentations and staying on time. We have about four or five minutes for questions, and we've gotten uh, two questions so far. So I will rephrase them slightly, but open them up uh, to our panel. The first, they actually both deal directly with uh, Steve's talk. Um, one is a woman has known FH, but has a cholesterol below the treatment thresholds. Uh, when should that person be started on? treatment and does having FH matter? So there's a complex question. Yes, I think I as, to, uh, as, as a geneticist, I think I'm going to pass that on to one, one of the, my um, uh, clinical colleagues. It's maybe something yeah. that um, uh, Janine or, or Meryl should look at. To I don't know, Meryl, I'll take that because I think the woman is from Turkey. Uh, can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry, I missed it. Yes, your, uh, your LDL cholesterol is below a treatment threshold in current guidelines, but you have the FH gene. Should you be on a statin? And if so, when should you start treatment? Yeah, I think the most important thing is, the, uh, is having a coronary artery disease or the family history. Uh, because uh, if these numbers are letting the cholesterol to enter the intima of the artery, or the, I want to mean that if this uh, level of cholesterol is easy to uh, lead to uh, the generation of ateroma, then we have to lower it. Uh, I think the most important thing is this. Uh, so, um, do do I mean what I want to say uh, that the uh, Genetically, you are having FH and you have a family history or you are in the secondary prevention, then you have to lower uh, this LDL. Uh, I believe that uh, to uh, be pr protected from uh, cardiovascular events. Thank you. I think um, <clears throat> the importance of the FH gene is that it contributes to lifelong higher levels of cholesterol, as was shown in Steve's figures, I don't think we really have a good guideline 
to account for that. But I think if you have the gene, you're getting into your 20s and 30s, if you're even if your cholesterol is not, let's say 190 or four or five millimoles per liter, I might, if the patient is interested, I might think about starting early, even a preventive situation. The second question is loaded and it may carry over to our next webinar. <clears throat> a woman with homozygous FH is pregnant, but her treatment options are limited. So maybe Janine just, and also the person is concerned about having a heart attack while pregnant. Janine, do you wanna say a few words on that? Yeah, um, uh, well, homozy even within homozygous FH, you have uh, different uh, sorts uh, and sizes. So uh, some homozygous FH is more severe than others. Um, and of course, yeah, you have to stop the cholesterol lowering uh, treatment. The only thing that can be continued is the LDL apheresis. Um, and I have homozygous FH patients who have not, well, they have, of course, everybody has high cholesterol, but they not have not so high cholesterol. So I just stop them and I don't uh, put them on apheresis. And in uh, different, uh, well, some women, it, it is necessary to, to uh, keep on performing the apheresis. Uh, and of course, it's a higher risk in uh, women with homozygous FH compared to women who don't have homozygous FH. But there has been literature of other women with homozygous FH who had children. So uh, it, it, it is well possible. And also uh, it is possible uh, to be pregnant without a heart disease and uh, myocardial infarction. Thank you. I think you can also take rosins while you're yeah, pregnant. You can take, not yeah. Absorbed. Um, they will lower cholesterol only a bit, but of course, every uh, bit will help. So the, the re, uh, that, that's also medications um, called the cephalam or the cholesterol that are the medication because they stay in the intestine. So they, they don't come to the, the fetus. So it's safe. We had a couple of questions related to LDL treatment goals. Uh, men versus women and also in children. So I'm just gonna handle those quickly myself. So there are no differences in treatment goals between men and women that are published. We do know that women um, unfortunately get treated less intensively for adults. Uh, the treatment goals are dependent on whether or not you've had a heart attack. So typically they're under a hundred or two and a half millimoles per liter under 70 or about two millimoles per liter if you uh, have had a heart attack and under 55 or about one and a quarter millimoles per liter if you're extremely high risk. For children, it's 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is about three and a half um, millimoles uh, per liter. That would be the goal, not quite as, um, as low as for an adult. So those are all the questions and we have five minutes left. It's now time I think for our last two audience response polls. So Anne, would you like to take over? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just share them now. You're welcome to talk a little bit more if there's any one thing you want to summarize before we just get this started. Yeah, we just want to remind people that webinar two in this series is specifically uh, devoted to FH in pregnancy. And we have some returning panelists and some new panelists. For that, there will be an EAS webinar on women and heart disease forthcoming. And uh, for all the professionals in the audience, please keep an eye out for that. And the third thing is in the, we've already had some discussion of this, but in this COVID era, remember that if you have symptoms of heart disease, you should go to the hospital because uh, there are now effective treatments for heart disease. And unless you go to the hospital, you can't get them. 
And uh, unfortunately, in this COVID era, people are more afraid of going to the hospital. But um, if you think you have heart problems, the hospital's where you need to be. So when you get those messages across, we have some slides. I think so, we have one more um, Slido poll here. We well, just want to, I'll just run that now. Okay, well, this uh, looks like we're getting some positive feedback here. <laughs> we were like, getting, oh, we're all feeling sorry. good. Thanks for massaging we getting, the egos of all our panelists. Then we would like to hear from you if there's any other topics you would like for us to address. Obviously, this is super important, and we'll keep this question open so you can answer now or a little later. All right. LP little a, top of the list. All right, I'm getting more positive uh, vibes. Which is also right. good. All right. Sam, I'm trying to hide here, but I am absolutely delighted. It's Magda speaking. There's been a lot more questions coming from Facebook, live streaming on chat. We will try to address those, everyone. Obviously, we want to make sure that we stick to time, but in the follow-up email that everyone will get, we will try to direct you to the recording of this webinar and <laughs> answers to some of those questions. Um, before we disconnect, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to wonderful panelists and a huge thank you to all the participants. And, and, and I'm really delighted to see that we met your expectations. Uh, I just had to say that, Sam, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you know me. That's fine. I, uh, unfortunately, since I'm on the East Coast of the United States, I can't retire and have a drink of wine right now. So I'd like everyone in Europe to have a nice glass of wine. I will have one for you. I'm going to go out and actually build some fences around apple trees in my yard after this. So that's my exercise to improve my cardiovascular health. With my wife, who will be improving her cardiovascular health at the same Sam, if I can just, just comment, sure. uh, several of the questions that have come up on this slide, uh, we are about FH uh, diagnosis and, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and just again to, to make it clear that the, the, the next webinar, which I, is going to be addressing quite a lot of those questions. So, so stay, stay tuned. Yeah, the FH and pregnancy, or FH webinar, next webinar will be excellent. We have some really great patient uh, advocates uh, and great science. So it's gonna be a very interesting webinar. <laughs>